Um, just a second here, I will start sharing my screen. <clears throat> All right, you should all be seeing um, my PowerPoint now. Um, I'm just going to close a couple of these windows so stuff doesn't pop up while I'm trying to present here. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, I'm Karen Mitchell. I'm the Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist. I'm in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at Purdue. Uh, so I was uh, previously in the Tippecanoe County A&R position and uh, really uh, dug into the horticulture side of things. And now I'm on campus getting to um, really uh, focus on my passion for gardening. And so, um, as I mentioned before, kind of who I am and what I do is that I help uh, stakeholders around the state to uh, plan for a sustainable garden. So the worst thing um, that I, I feel like can happen is that I, I give everybody the tools to start the garden um, and then it doesn't maintain itself. <laughs> so we want to make sure that when we plan our gardens that we're think we're forward thinking and we're thinking for the future. And so I only have, you know, the 50 minutes or so here um, to go over quite a few topics. And so we're just going to hit on a few of the hot topics, right? This is for this hot topic series about sustainable gardening. And before I dive in too much, I would be, um, it would be, you know, sorely missed opportunity to let you know that we have a pruning workshop, a fruit pruning workshop coming up on March 1st. Uh, that is limited registration. Uh, so if everybody on this call were to go and sign up right now, we would immediately fill up. Uh, but there is a wait list and we have uh, the option of, of considering, you know, upping that registration number. So feel free to register if you do get to the wait list, uh, put yourself on there because we will try to accommodate everyone. And if you're really into the fruits, uh, Purdue Extension has this great newsletter called Facts for Fancy Fruit. Uh, this is a commercial uh, for commercial and amateur fruit growers. Uh, they tell you all of the, the, the very timely hot topics, right, regarding fruit. So if you have fruit trees, um, go ahead and sign up for the Fancy Fruit uh, newsletter. And again, I won't I won't spend the whole 50 minutes uh, promoting, but uh, when we're talking about gardening and vegetables and fruits and all these other things, we can't um, you know go without uh, mentioning the Small Farm Conference coming up March 2nd and 3rd in Danville, Indiana. Um, so it's a great. Uh, it's been going on for over 10 years now, and it just keeps growing and getting better. Uh, great network of people. So if you're interested, this is definitely more for the commercial side of things. Um, if you're if you're in uh, diversified farming and, and food systems for um, usually for profit. And then speaking of the vegetables, we have a vegetable crops hotline, right? So this is another newsletter out there to keep you informed of all those um, timely things that pop up. So today, I, that's enough with the uh, um, promotion, right? So today uh, seems like a pretty straightforward path that we're gonna be following here. We're discussing uh, planning a sustainable garden and I, I think it's pretty safe to assume that everyone on here um, knows what it takes to garden, right? It's pretty simple. You learned in second grade, you put the seed in the soil, add water. If you want fruit, you're going to need those pollinators and then cue the birds and bees discussion, right? So <laughs> we are going to discuss how uh, soil, water, uh, pollinators, and people, um, how the impact um, regulate within the garden and how we can introduce methods to manage these resources sustainably. And I know I said this uh, seems like a very straightforward path, but it's going to be much more like this um, perennial herb garden where you can take many turns and twists all around um, to get to the same spot. So there's a lot of ways to garden. And, um, you know, it's it's a growing experience uh, for you personally, and um, obviously you're growing for, for 
uh, the benefits of plants. But before I get too much further into this, I keep throwing out the word sustainable. Um, and often uh, when you think of sustainable gardening, uh, people will say, well, there's not a specific de definition, right? There's all of this, um, people kind of throw out sustainable a lot these days. It's one of those, um, those, those key words uh, to get, grab people's attention. Uh, but when I was looking for the actual definition of sustainable, I, I really liked the American Horticultural Society's definition as to perpetuate uh, existence as well as to provide sustenance and nourishment. Um, so we are trying to uh, maintain our yields at a certain rate or level year after year, um, according to Oxford, or we can go through Miriam uh, Webster, a method of using a resource so that the resource is not depleted or permanently damaged. Uh, so when I think of gardening and as a horticultural specialist, I want to make sure that we're thinking, uh, you know, for the future as well, not just for this season's harvest. And I think it's very important that we, um, as gardeners, uh, think in that that forward-thinking way. Um, so we'll we'll talk about how we're going to sustain the soil, right? And this is only 50 minutes, so I'm not going to get too in depth in soil science. Don't worry. Uh, but when planting a garden, a lot of people will think of the placement first, right? Where is the most sun? Where is uh, the water? Um, and we all know that we want full sun, uh, but sometimes the soil can be almost an afterthought for people. Uh, many novice gardeners will just assume that all soil is created equal. And as gardeners, um, as more advanced gardeners, we know that that is just not the case. Um, soil is not created equal. And so when planning, uh, your garden. We want to consider the soil um, in the placement. So you can essentially grow your soil along with your garden, um, but there are going to be some components of your soil that may take a lifetime to change. Uh, so if you start with a really hard, compacted clay soil, um, and you don't have years to amend it and build that soil up and have to wait for years to plant that first soil, you might wanna consider um, building up instead of working down in the soil. But before we again begin you know, working or building our soil, uh, we have to know what we're starting with. And so in extension, we have this uh, saying, don't guess, soil test. Uh, and this won't be a presentation on soil testing, but I would be remiss to, to not mention that, which would be the first thing that we um, consider when we're working with our soils. So if you do have more questions about soil testing, uh, I encourage you to reach out to your county educator. Um, so they might have soil sampling bags for you. Um, they can at least help point you in that right direction for that. Um, and so I'm going to be discussing how we can use uh, mulch, compost, and cover crops uh, to build and sustain our soil because that's going to be one of the most important parts for our garden. So mulching, this should be a key component of your garden, right? regardless of what you're growing, fruits, vegetables, ornamentals, we need mulch. Um, Oxford defines mulch as a material that is spread around the plant to enrich and insulate the soil. Um, so this can be wood chips, grass clippings, decaying leaves. Um, there are so many different options for mulch. There's even a plastic mulch product out there, right? And when we think about a sustainable garden, I hope that a plastic mulch uh, would raise a red flag for you. And, and plastic mulch has its place, but this place is not in your garden. Uh, so plastic mulch will be best used in a playground. So when planning your garden, um, be forward thinking again, um, when we're thinking about 
uh, landscape fabric, for example. Um, yes, it keeps the weeds down this season, uh, but next year you may find that this landscape fabric has essentially become a part of your soil. Um, you can see here on the right hand side, the roots um, and the weeds have just intertwined with the fabric. Uh, so instead of using a synthetic material uh, that you're going to be battling in years to come, um, and you can see at the very top here, I was lucky enough to find a very rusted um, uh, pin that held down that fabric. So uh, let's think maybe of using um, organic materials, which you can often find for free. Uh, here's an example on the, on the left-hand side of just using newspapers. Uh, this was actually newspapers um, topped with a tiny bit of compost and then uh, oats as a cover crop. To kind of, so uh, my plants, uh, my vegetables weren't growing like that into the, the newspaper, but my cover crops did. So, well, let me step back there. I, uh, when we're thinking about mulch, it has the um, potential, it helps to retain the soil moisture, right? So that's going to come and play when we talk about conserving our water and, and being sustainable overall. Um, but not only does it build uh, or, or retain your moisture in your soil, it's also going to help build up that soil. So all of that brown materials, so cardboard, mulch, all of these things are just food for your for your soil. It's that carbon rich material that then gets worked in uh, through the plants, through decomposition with fungal uh, species and worms, et cetera. So all of those, that microbiome is going to take all that mulch down and build, incorporate it into your soil, much like the, the worms were trying to do with the landscape fabric, but failed to do so, right? Um, and so this is something that you can do each year, um, adding that mulch, adding whether, whatever kind it may be. And another part when we think of uh, sustaining our soil or building our soil or growing our soil is compost. This needs to be in the forefront of your mind when you're thinking of a garden because with a garden comes organic waste. Um, <clears throat> so many different ways to do compost. And again, this could be a whole you know, hour talk on just composting, but I'm not going to get that deep into it. Just wanna make sure that when you are thinking of your garden, you are thinking about where that waste is going to be or be dumped and how you're gonna utilize that because uh, this season's waste is going to be next year's uh, food and nutrients for those plants and micro microbiome of your soils. So whether it's a huge compost bin where you're, you know, loading in uh, new debris. So this one's four or five pallets deep for a community garden. So this was very large area, um, three bins though. And so we would have a new debris, the let it rot stage. And then I didn't, I didn't include the picture of the the compost that's ready because it disappeared very quickly. And so it was just an empty bin. Um, so the compost is considered like a black gold for, um, for gardeners. And so don't throw it out, uh, make sure we're composting. You can use something as simple as a wire um, mesh. So like a hard wire cloth um, to and circle, uh, make this little thing. And this can be movable. So if you are at the end of the season, you have a lot of uh, leaves, for example, that you want to compost, you can have one of these turn, you know, you put it, bind it into a circle, you can put a stake or a T-post in there to hold it up. And then you can just load all your leaves in there for um, the season. And so Obviously, we've got the very commercial bins that you can go over here on the right hand side is the, the tumbler. Um, you know, these are decent for small amounts of compost. So if you're only composting for a small household, um, but maybe not for a large garden. 
And then here's another example of a three bin. Uh, this one was actually in an urban garden, so it needed to be rodent proof. <laughs> so they had the wire um, lid to go over it and the panels to go in the front to make it as rodent proof as possible. But, um, you know, as you know, mice uh, will find uh, food if there is some to be had. <clears throat> Another um, method of composting that's maybe not always considered is just composting in place. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see a large cinder block bed um, that there was not enough funds to fill with rich soil. Uh, so straw bales, grass clippings, and compost for a couple of years to help build that up. Um, and so after about four years of straw bale gardening with uh, compost added, uh, that bed was quickly filled with a very rich uh, soil. So only had to de de add a couple inches of, of soil on top of that compost to then use it as a garden. On the right hand side you'll see um, it's, a, it's a method that's similar to what we you'll hear as called hugo culture um, composting where it's a hugo culture bed where you're using large pieces of organic matter um, branches sticks on the bottom cover it with mulch cover it with compost add you know add some soil and and there you go so all of that um, wood material underneath is going to continue to compost over time and begin to fill up uh, the bottom of that bed with really nice rich uh, compost <clears throat> And then the last part about um, sustaining our soil, and it's not just about soils, so you'll hear cover crops come up again, um, but cover crops in the home garden uh, are, are picking up steam. So you, it's, it's more common now uh, to be able to find smaller bags of cover crops at your nursery or garden center. Um, you know, there's Again, this could be a whole hour talk in itself. Um, and I would love to talk about cover crops more, but main benefits that we think of when we think of cover crops is reducing erosion, right? So you're keeping your soil in place. Um, that's a great, great part for sustaining your soil is not letting it leave your property in the first place. Uh, it improves your soil structure. So building that tilth, that nice uh, crumbly, uh, soil that we just love to get our hands into, right? Uh, reducing weeds. So there's some cover crops out there that will, will basically um, cover and uh, smother out weeds, not allowing them to germinate. Uh, another great benefit of cover crops is recycling nutrients. So you're growing, so in this picture here is just buckwheat. Uh, you're growing a a crop of buckwheat and then to terminate it and you're not going to harvest it like we do with our vegetables right so in a vegetable garden we're constantly pulling out the nutrients we grow these great big pumpkins and then we take them out of the garden well we just took out a lot of the nutrients that um, the plants in the future will need so by putting in these cover crops um, they're grabbing the nutrients out of the soil, and then we kill it, and then we let all those nutrients go back into the soil. Um, and so this is not only going to help recycle the nutrients that we have in the soil, but it's also going to improve soil fertility. Uh, so some of our cover crops like radish or um, nitro radish, uh, turnips, can go very deep down, and they're going to be grabbing nutrients from further down in the soil profile and bringing those back up. And so they'll bring them up to the top and then we kill the cover crop and the nutrients now are on the top a uh, few inches of the soil where our, where our uh, harvested crop will benefit. And then not only all these benefits for our crops and our soil, but they're also gonna be providing forage and habitat. So we mentioned the pollinators early, earlier, we'll get back to that. <clears throat> So conserving water, so we, we 
you know, we've talked about building up our soil. Well, the second really important part of a garden is water. Um, here in Indiana, we are somewhat lucky. We have quite a bit of rainfall throughout the year, but um, we also have dry, dry periods. So we're not immune to the droughts. Uh, they do come around, not as much as what we're seeing in California, uh, but hopefully, um, you know, we, we're not going to be wasting our water. So when we talk about conserving water, I used to use one of those really nice oscillating sprinklers that just sprayed water everywhere. Um, and now that's only for the kids. It's not for the garden. So put away those um, sprinklers that are just spraying our uh, all the water up into the air. And let's let's think about other ways to conserve that. So save the sprinklers for the kids to play in. I uh, mentioned mulch, right? So mulch is conserving our water. So let's go back to that and add mulch when we are gardening. Another way we can uh, conserve and ut better utilize our water sources are using rain barrels. <clears throat> I'd encourage you to reach out to your, um, you know, your soil and water district or your waste management um, in your county. Here in Tip Canoe, they offer um, rain barrels. And so there might be some other counties around Indiana that um, will offer a rain barrel here in Tupinu, I was able to just volunteer at a couple events and I get a free rain barrel. So, um, but they do also have them for sale. So consider installing that rain barrel um, and then using a drip irrigation line coming off of that or even um, a soaker hose, right? So if you have, if it's during the time where we just have so much water, we don't know what to do with, um, collecting it in a rain barrel and then using a soaker hose to just draw it out towards, um, you know, a, a drier part of your of your landscape, um, that is going to help tremendously. So when you think of rain coming off and down a dry, uh, down your downspout. Um, it's coming out in gushes and it's mostly going to be running off down the driveway into the gutters or into the drains um, down into the river. So the, the anything that we can do to help keep the water on our property um, is going to help overall. So the more water that's going down through our soil <clears throat> and infiltrating into, you know, and eventually replenishing ground supplies. So we don't want that rain to, to, to just run off by capturing it in a rain barrel or a rain garden, um, we're helping to conserve that water. And speaking of uh, rain, rain gardens, uh, Purdue does have a rainscaping um, uh, course. And so I'm actually gonna, I'll put in our little website for rainscaping if you are interested in learning more about um, how to conserve and utilize that in your own garden. Um, I also s just noticed that there's a couple uh, questions in the chat. So uh, before I get too much further past uh, the mulch in the soil, uh, straw is a great mulch, <laughs> um, often can be found for free. Um, if you're, you know, have um, events that going on in your town that, you know, we're using a lot of straw bales for seeding or whatever it may be. Um, that's, that's often trash to those event um, uh, promoters. And so they want, they want the straw bales gone. So um, keep your eye, eye out for straw bales. I definitely prefer um, a seasoned straw bale. <laughs> so a lot of people will use a brand new dry straw bale that's really light. Yeah. And it's nice and it just it breaks apart really easily. Um, I prefer the seasoned uh, straw bale, which means I like to either find or purchase straw in the fall and let it over winter. Um, if I buy it early enough in the fall, and I water it and it's still warm outside 
any weed seeds that are in that straw bale will actually start to um, germinate. And so you'll get rid of some of the weed seeds before you're putting it into your garden by, by allowing them to germinate and then die off. Um, I also like them, here, let me go back. Um, did I? I'm not sure why my chat is not, oh, there it goes. That's weird. Um, apologize for that <laughs> chat stuff. Too. Um, but let me go back real quick to um, the mulch straw. This picture um, right here on the upper left hand side, um, you can see. So I did have some dry straw this year, um, but then also had a, well, I didn't have enough seasoned straw as, as it was, but it comes off in the really nice like flakes, like um, matted um, uh, chunks of straw and they kind of, you know, peel off in these chunks and it's great for the pathway because it's denser. Um, it's also already started to decompose a little bit, it's heavier, so it um, stays in place a little bit better than that draw, dry straw that you might want to um, utilize. <clears throat> uh, on And one more question about composting before we get too far is weeds. Uh, so adding weeds to your compost, um, there's, you know, you don't want to add weeds that have gone to seed. Uh, so you want to make sure that if, if, it's flowering even because a lot of weeds have um, adaptations where if you if they think they're about to die and they have a flower that flower if it, if it's been pollinated can still go to seed uh, so if it's flowered it's best to keep it out of your of your compost unless you are being very um, you know uh, if you're working your compost a lot, you're measuring temperature, you're trying to get it hot. Um, a lot of the methods that I, you know, see people using and that are going to be uh, most utilized because there's less labor are the ones that ne don't necessarily get as hot as it needs to be to kill a wheat seed. So it's best to just keep those weeds out. Um, if you have anything that spreads by uh, rhizome or stolons like um, Canada thistle. I don't care if it's gone to seed or not, you keep Canada thistle out of the compost. Um, so there's definitely some weeds that you would want to keep out, um, especially if you're uh, not doing a higher maintenance compost pile. So back onto um, the uh, water conservation. So when we think of conserving our water, um, a lot of times we'll think about how we can use the non-potable things, so, you know, the, the runoff from the roof, you know, how can we keep the water here by using mulch? Uh, but one way to think about uh, using water uh, conserv conservatively would be making sure you have the right plant in the right place. Um, so having a, um, uh, you know, a high maintenance lawn that needs watered fruit that you want to keep green throughout the summer, it's going to need a lot of water. Um, you know, so here we like to use the cool season crops or cool season grasses because we have more cool weather than we have really hot weather. But in the hot weather, you're going to have to water that if you want it green. Um, and so maybe considering if you are one of those people that really wants a green lawn, you know, trying to incorporate maybe a mix of cool and warm season grasses. Um, so just considering the plants that you're using um, and making sure that you're not, you know, planting a water hog um, just, just because, right? We want to think about um, how we can best utilize our, our gardens and our plants. <clears throat> Um, so I've heard uh, there's a question about the rain barrels. Um, chemicals from roof tiles can be collected, um, issues with water. And, and so this can be a concern. 
um, with an edible garden. Uh, best way to uh, you know mitigate you know that is to just avoid it if you're you're using um, roof uh, shingles for um, rain collection. So a lot of times you can get um, people say, oh well, I've got a metal roof, you know, so there's not all these chemicals from the shingles, but then you have the potential for um, animals, um, you know, birds and, and such uh, on your roof and then the anything washing down from those animals. And so it's best to keep um, rain barrel water off of your edible garden. But if you use um, drip irrigation and you're not irrigating in like leafy greens, um, anything that's coming in contact with the soil, you're going to be a lot better off. So um, drip irrigation, keeping the water off the leaves is really good for plant health anyway, um, but also uh, is, is helps to mitigate any food safety risks. <clears throat> um, so uh, some of the new pesticides in straw are very persistent and will not break down in compost piles. Uh, that is a very, um, valid concern and you know it's it's um it's one of those things where you know you're it's really hard to know you know at the, you'll often see straw bales they'll say you know oh we weed free we no no weed seeds um and i don't know if i've ever found one that that was accurate except for those like shrink wrapped um straw bales i don't know if anybody's seen the it's like where they've just vacuum sealed this uh straw and i think that's been heat treated so that there's no um seeds in there uh, but i think it's like 14 dollars a bale or something so um not something i get to utilize very often uh but that is a you know a concern of pesticides being used in straw i I'm not sure how we can uh, get around that with, um, you know, whether you know your your farmer that's, you know, baling straw. Uh, it's not as if often anymore that people um, know their farmers that, that intimately. Uh, but yes, you know, if, if that is a concern, you could try a test plot um, where you're putting down the straw and then seeing if you can get things to germinate out of it. Um, I have luckily not come across that problem yet, but I'd be, I'd be curious to see how, how often that is. Um, <laughs> so where do I find free straw? Well, you uh, typically volunteering. <laughs> so that's, uh, whether it's with the master gardeners or with, uh, local, uh, events and things. So I, yeah, yeah, I'll take tickets. I'll stand at the jump booth. Oh, you need help cleaning up here. Let me, uh, grab this straw bale for you. <laughs> so, uh, that's, yeah, just, uh, just how I've made those contacts over the years. A uh, lot, a lot of volunteering at random events, um, just so I can scope out the straw. <laughs> so let's, um, go on. We're already um, half over halfway through for the. So I want to make sure I get to cover it all. Um, so when we are thinking about a sustainable garden, you want to plan ahead for how you're going to protect your pollinators and your beneficials. Um, cover crops. Did I mention mulch and cover crops? All these great things. They have dual purposes. So cover crops can be used as a green mulch. They can also be used to draw pollinators in. Uh, so buckwheat, for example, is a you know when it goes to flower, it will just be covered in pollinators. So cover crops can definitely help um, keep something blooming throughout the the year, um, but also delaying the garden cleanup. I know fall we have call outs and we say okay let's let everybody go out to the garden and just clean it. It's not so common anymore, thankfully. Um, and I, you know, before is, this is becoming more of a uh, mainstream trend, uh, so people are aware. 
uh, but I was often uh, accused of being a lazy gardener because I did not clean my garden in the fall. I would remove any weeds or diseased plants, um, but then tend to leave whatever else, you know, even if even the, the pepper plant, those roots that are down in there um, are going to help aerate the soil. They're doing great things, but also just the stems uh, above ground, having those stems, um, hollow stems, uh, you know, you'll find a lot of um, uh, solitary bees. So these are typically bees that, that are going to leave you alone. They don't sting. They're not really territorial because they're um, they're just solitary. And so those solitary um, bees really like those hollowed out stems. <laughs> so if you can delay that end of the year cleanup until spring, um, and until you basically see new growth. So you know, obviously this will apply a little bit more um, in an in a ornamental uh, or a native garden more than your vegetable garden, but even uh, leaving uh, your plant debris in the vegetable garden is, is going to help your composting in place, right? So a lot of the nutrients that were left in the stems and foliage are going to be going down into the soil. Um, but then the, um, the organic matter can also be good as a habitat for your, your beneficials. <clears throat> And so I, I put in here, find your friends. Uh, and that's because I have a, a presentation I'm preparing right now that's called Find Your Friends, uh, Get to Know Your uh, Beneficial Insects. And this is really important because a lot of times people will see bee-like insects or, you know, a, or something crawling and, and immediately assume it's a pest. Uh, or that they don't want that there. So in this photo here, you'll see, um, this is, uh, I'm not gonna say the name right. So I'm gonna call it the common name, which is either a flower fly or a hover fly on spider wart. Um, and so this little thing looks very much like a bee and to somebody that didn't know um, better would um, assume that it was a bee. And they call them hoverflies because they tend to just hover around you. <laughs> um, you'll swat, swat at them. And, and so kids especially will think that there's this bee that's um, trying to stalk them down, but uh, it's not the case. So these um, are, are harmless. They're not going to... Um, typically will not bother you, but their larva, so the, the babies of the, the flower fly, the larva are really important predators for aphids. And so, you know, if you immediately jump to the conclusion that this is something you don't want in your garden and you start spraying, you know, insecticides because you don't want a bunch of um, stinging wasps in your garden, um, you may find that you have an influx in aphids after that because um, these uh, are really important for our um, keeping down our aphid populations. Uh, so getting to know the beneficials in your garden, um, looking up or asking an educator, your county educator, um, if you find an insect that you don't know, don't assume it's a pest because there are actually a lot more um, beneficials out there than most people are aware. And so trying to bring in these um, pollinators, these beneficial insects, um, the easiest way to do that is going to be planting native plants. So these are the plants that have, you know, co-evolved along with these pollinators and, and these beneficials. And so they, they um, really need um, their, their natural source of, of food and, and habitat and all of these things. So native plants um, are going to not only feed your garden, uh, but feed our overall ecosystem uh, by bringing in more. And so the more people that are planting natives, um, the better, because, you know, I, I might have a really large native garden in my yard, um, but if I'm the only one in, you know, five square miles, you know, these, these beneficial insects are not, you're not going to see a huge increase in them because um, you're kind of in this just island of, of goodness. So you might have a few um, in your garden, but it's going to be better. The more people that start to do this, um, the better off we're going to be overall.
And so I'm going to end with the people aspect of gardening, right? So um, it's easy to think, you know, I've, oh, okay, I've thought of the soil, I've thought of the water, I've got the sun, I've got everything I need for a garden. Well, a garden is just a patch of wildflowers without people, right? So um, a garden needs cultivation. And to do that, we need people. Uh, so before you just dive in with planting a garden, um, and because it can be really exciting uh, to, to see all this growth, um, think about your overall goal. Uh, I, I say this a lot in my presentations because a lot of times you'll get so um, excited about the thought of having this huge uh, vineyard in your backyard where you can just harvest grapes. Um, yeah, that goal is great, If um, but we're going to have to consider um, how to make it sustainable for you and the people that are utilizing the garden. So how much physical labor is it going to take? How much uh, money, you know, financial inputs, and then your mental well-being. I use gardening as a therapy, basically. That's that's where I take out my aggression on native or invasive species and uh, pull the dandelion, <laughs> see how far I can get that root up. Um, so this is, a, you know, mental therapy for me. And if you find yourself uh, you know, planting this huge garden and then it's it's stressing you out mentally and financially and physically, this is not the goal, right? So um, I, make sure that when you when you're planning this that you consider, okay, you know, how much can I handle? Start small if you haven't, you know, had a garden before um, and and consider, the inputs that you're going to need uh, throughout the life of that garden. Uh, so we want to make sure, uh, you know, there's so many studies out right now, even um, national health organizations that are doing research on how gardening um, improves in uh, people's lives in, in so many different ways. So make sure that it's improving your life, right? If it becomes uh, something that's uh, physically, financially, and mentally draining, uh, it's not sustainable. So don't forget about the people. Um, and let's see a new... Oh. Uh, I can say, so somebody said, great slide. I'm not sure if they're talking about this one, but uh, this is one of my favorite pictures, actually. So this day was a very stressful day for me. Uh, you know, things were just not working out. And then I got to meet up with a uh, master gardener. And um, this young girl uh, was not having a good day either until we we met up with Jim and started playing in the garden. Uh, so that that was a huge stress relief for me. And we got to take our, our all of our angst out on the mulch while we dug and climbed up that hill. So um, make sure that when we think of a sustainable garden that we're considering all the aspects of a garden, right? Um, and plan ahead for these things. Um, make sure the compost is is in a spot that can be utilized. Um, you know, if you are going to be uh, going after the big truckloads of mulch from the landscape companies, um, <clears throat> um, make sure that you have a spot where they can pull in and dump it. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I have helped um, start gardens that were in basically a courtyard. It was behind a bunch of houses. Uh, no truck was getting there. So everything was hauled uh, by me and a troop of Girl Scouts a good hundred yards to the garden. Um, but that was our only spot. So, uh, you know, we went with it and we knew ahead of time. We, we were like, well, this is the only way we're going to do it is if we have to, uh, we cleared a path through the brush to make sure that we can get wheelbarrows back and forth, uh, but not something I really wanted to do, right? If I could avoid it, I would have. Um, and so I'm glad to hear uh, that somebody's going to test their soil. I know we, we've, if you've attended extension uh, gardening talks, we, we, we say it a lot, soil test, soil test. 
Um, but that's because, you know, if you're purchasing uh, fertilizer, applying fertilizer without a soil test, you could be just wasting your money. Uh, not only wasting your money, but also harming the environment. Uh, so a lot of times we don't need that extra phosphorus in our soils and uh, you won't know that until you soil test. Uh, so save yourself some money, save yourself some time, do the soil test uh, before you get in too deep. Uh, with that, that was um, actually kind of flew through it a little bit faster than I thought I was going to. So if we have any more questions, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, so I did see a question, is Purdue University soil testing for free? I wish we could. <laughs> so we actually don't do um, private soil testing anymore um, at the university because there are certified labs in Indiana. So Purdue University is not about competing um, with, the, with private industry. So uh, there are soil testing facilities. The only certified one in Indiana, I believe, is a and If uh, an educator is on that can't tell me otherwise. Certified lab, I believe the only one in Indiana is a and but there are um, other options. You know, uh, if you are closer to Ohio and Kentucky, uh, there are some labs, I believe, um, that are closer for the, the Southern folks, but it really, you just mail it in anyway at this point. So, um, the the distance is not too much of a factor when you're considering that soil test lab. <clears throat> so I just put in the facts for fancy fruit um, uh, link if you were interested in joining that. Um, and I was gonna. Hey Karen, could I? Yes. Hey, uh, so did you mention your um, grass to garden program? I did not. <laughs> I, I say that uh, just so um, for those of you who don't know, um, I, I'm more of a turf guy. So I produced the program, the turf program at the beginning that we shamelessly plug to help uh, establish turfs. Karen has actually got a program that goes from a grassy spot to a garden. So if you think Purdue doesn't cover it all, we cover it all. Uh, whether you're going uh, to a sports field or trying to make a nice lawn to a garden, Karen has a, a good program uh, with that. Yes, we're actually right in the middle of our virtual series right now. Well, no, next week will be the last week. Um, and so we are hoping to see some in-person offerings of the grass to garden course um, over the year, but we don't have any on the schedule yet. So that's why I didn't put anything up there. Um, but if you are interested in the grass to garden course, it is uh, four weeks, you know, one, one session a week. And we, it's so much more than gardening, right? So it's, it's very little gardening. Um, I know it's called grass to garden, but uh, the first session is all about community development and engagement. So, you know, how to make sure you have that network of people that's going to make your garden sustainable. Um, so this is all about community-based gardens, right? So if you're interested in just the home gardening aspect and you're not looking to um, build a community type garden. We also have a program called Get Growing. That's because we just can't seem to use grow enough <laughs> things when it comes to gardening. So we have the Get Growing, which is definitely, you know, more focused on just um, homeowners, do, you know, doing their own gardens. And then we have the Grass to Garden, which is about taking those large um, vacant lots or, you know, fields of grass and turning them into a community-based garden. So lots of different things if you aren't already connected with Extension, which I'm not sure how you would have found this if you weren't, um, but uh, make sure that you reach out to your county educator, get on their mailing list, let them know what you're interested in and, and they will find a program for you. <clears throat> so back to the soil testing labs, um, I did find a link that has quite a few labs that are on it. Please feel free to reference that. Um, yes, there is a &L Great Lakes Lab is in Indiana, but if you, you're more comfortable using somebody else, feel free to use them as well. So. But I was right, the a and the only one in Indiana. Yeah. Yes, the only one in Indiana, yes. 
Well, I appreciate the invitation um, to speak today and <laughs> not sure if I covered the, the exact topic. You said garden planning and I was like, well, that sounds kind of, you know, eh, garden planning, We're sustainable, right? We want to make it a hot topic. We're going to throw the word sustainable into it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. This was really informative. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Um, if anyone has questions for Karen, um, feel free to raise your hand, shoot her an email, um, put them in the chat. But thank you all. Well, I, I tried.